monumental miscellanea, and funerary paraphernalia. It's Archaeodeath. Hello, it's Professor Howard Williams here of the Department of History and Archaeology at the University of Chester. And I thought I'd come out and spend a bit of my Sunday by a beautiful river, Clywedog, in uh, North East Wales, uh, not far from Chester, a short uh, drive out to uh, tell you something about why Chester is such a great place to come and study archaeology and also to give you an introduction to my more formal lecture which I shall be giving from a more uh, sedate repose in my archaeo den where I'm doing my work at the moment. So the first point to say is that uh, Chester sits at the centre of the British Isles. It sits uh, on the Irish Sea coast uh, as a historic trading port linked to the Irish Sea by the D estuary. Uh, we are uh, in Cheshire but we are very close to North Wales. We're close to Lancashire and the big cities of Liverpool and Manchester and of course we're near to Shropshire. So in every regard Chester sits in a sort of hub and uh, in its hinterland um, which is rich and diverse in wildlife, historic and uh, prehistoric remains, and as a city itself is an exciting and really uh, rich in heritage uh, for you to explore during your time here. Um, in addition to that, I would say the department is at, um, at a university campus that's only 15 minutes walk from the city centre, um, 20, 20 minutes walk uh, from the railway station. It's well connected, it's very central. And also, while we're quite a big university, it feels quite small and homely. Um, but the campuses are spread out over different parts, different faculties and different campuses. We're on the main campus and it feels really quite uh, petite. It's quite a homely, friendly city and a homely, friendly campus. Put that together and archaeology at Chester is, a, is an appropriate and an unsurpassable ideal location to study the ancient past and the recent past. My colleagues include lecturers in heritage, specialists in uh, Stone Age archaeology, in uh, later prehistoric and Roman period archaeology, early medieval and more recent modern and contemporary archaeology. So we can give you a good uh, introduction to the wide range of archaeological subjects around the globe and in Northwest Europe and in Britain. But in addition to that, we can give you a grounding in practical archaeology, in theoretical archaeology, and the different themes that we approach allow us to take you on a journey through many different types of, of archaeology, from um, of landscape reconstruction to looking at standing buildings, looking at uh, war memorials, <laughs> looking at uh, ancient cemeteries and settlements, and at looking at the landscape itself. So we can take you on a, on a really diverse and rich journey. So that's my introduction to why archaeology and why Chester. Now I'll take you on a journey and give you a case study in some of my research linked to the archaeology of the early Middle Ages or Dark Ages, if you prefer, the period from about uh, 450 to 1100 AD or CE. I want to show you one of Britain's most famous and impressive ancient monuments at this location in uh, Wrexham Borough, um, southwest of Chester, the uh, linear earthwork from the late 8th century, known as Offa's Dyke, um, goes in and out of visibility. Behind me, it simply looks like a modern hedgerow, and uh, there's nothing archaeological here. But on a closer inspection, you can realise that actually, um, as it drops down to the river, to that way, you can see it crossing the Clywedog. Now, this was built by the Mercian kings as a linear frontier work not as a border in a modern sense, but as a way of controlling movement in peace and war through this landscape and to control taxation, but also to stop raiding and to actually allow the Mercians themselves to raid westwards without retaliation. So it was a, an aggressive as much as a defensive monument. But here, it simply looks like a, a hedge boundary. But as we go down to the river, and there's lots of kids here, so I can't really do a video, but actually you can see across the river on that by that tree, Offa's Dyke continues, and it's on this side. This huge bank behind me here is the line of the bank, and by the stile over there, which I've just traversed, we're in the ditch of this huge monument. If you look back up the field where I just was, you can actually see there's a depression. That's not natural. That is the very denuded remains of a massive three meter deep ditch that's been slowly but surely filled in. Here we are approaching Offa's Dyke. This is coming up from the eastern side. 
This is one of the rare places where it survives crossing the valley of the River Clywedog. Climb up it. It really is a superb location. And this stream serves as its ditch at this location and there's therefore carved a, a really steep about a six meter groove in front of it all the way up this steep slope you can't see from this angle but it's only blocked by the river itself and therefore this gives us a real clear hint that there may have been a bridge at this location or chains crossing the river either way it proves that these river valleys were blocked by the monuments. And here is the tree where they've carved Offa into it. It's one of the few sculptures of Offa. You know, he's pointing in a kingly way. There's carved people digging the dike. There's his dike down there. And there's the sculpture. Okay, so having shown you out in the landscape a bit of Offa's Dyke, which is more difficult to see from the ground level where it's covered in vegetation, um, I want to now, back in my archaeo den, give you an insight into Britain's biggest monument. And it's not our best known monument. And just because it's big doesn't mean we know all about it. And that's the reason why me and a series of other scholars are doing research on it right now, collaborating with multiple universities, multiple organizations and local partners. So um, this is part of the Offers Dyke Collaboratory. More on that in a minute. Now, um, Offers Dyke is uh, dramatic when seen from the air. This is an aerial view taken by a drone photo photographer by Julian Ravist. And, and you can see looking south over the Clun Hills, the monument carving its way through the now cleared upland landscape of the Clun Forest. Now, it, we think it dates to the late 8th century. The name Offers Dyke is recorded as early as the 12th century and earlier than that still in the late 9th century, Asser, the biographer of Alfred the Great, tells us there was an ancient king called Offa who built a, a dike, a wall from sea to sea against the Welsh. And we do think this is King Offa of Mercia in the late 8th century. And he ruled from 757 to 796. And it was a contemporary of Charlemagne, the emperor of the, of the, of the, the Frankish Empire. So he, Offa was doing this carving this massive monument through the landscape, not on his own, of course, he probably had a workforce, um, as, as a Western frontier to his Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Mercia. This was a central English kingdom that at its height spread down to London and dominated Kent for a while, um, took over East Anglia and dominated his rivals in East Anglia, um, so went up to the Wash on the northeast and then went up to Chester and the Dee and also down to the Severn and Gloucestershire. So it was a big, that big sort of Midlands Britain um, or central England, shall we say, um, region that Mercia um, controlled and this was intended to articulate his western frontier against a series of Welsh rivals and um, we know it survives for at least 85 miles running along um, hills and into valleys blocking and controlling the landscape and um, it was about military might it wasn't simply a defensive line, as some scholars have suggested, to stop occasional raiders. Um, it was a, a major monument to dominate and control the landscape, to show military power, um, as well as um, to show his ability to mobilise resources and labour to do this work. So for Offa, it was more than simply about military power and dominating his neighbours. It was about um, controlling economically the landscape and resources to the east and perhaps also some areas to the west using the dike. And it was also about establishing his prestige as someone who was a, a rival and contemporary of Charlemagne who saw himself as an uh, inheritor of Roman imperial power and authority 
on a lower scale, smaller scale maybe, but Offa was trying to do the same for Britain, setting himself as the inheritor of the Roman world. And not, not only did he put his portrait onto coins for the first time with silver pennies, Offa was building monuments like he, he would have, his contemporaries would have known the ancient Romans built in Britain, but not to the north, Antonine and Hadrian's walls, but to the west against the Welsh rivals, who themselves saw themselves as the inheritors of Roman power. So everyone was trying to be the inheritors of the heirs to Rome and Offa was no exception. And this dyke may be part of that that vision as well. So it was about military might. It was about economic and social power. And it was also about prestige and a drawing on the power of the past. Let me hit you with some Offa's dyke facts. It's made up of multiple sections, and not everyone knows this. There's a counterscarp bank on the western side, and you can see it running there. This is at uh, Clanver Hill. Um, there's the ditch itself, which can be up to three metres deep. And we often don't think of ditches as major obstacles in and of themselves, but the term dike comes from the old English uh, ditch for a uh, ditch. <laughs> and uh, it, it would have been a, a V-shaped ditch with an ankle breaker at the bottom that may have been as deep as three metres. In other words, you're not getting across that quickly or easily, and you're certainly not getting that across that on a horse or, or with any um, captives or any large treasure or any, any, um, any, any um, animals, any herds of animals. So it's a major impedance in the landscape. The bank may have been at least three metres high. In some places, it may have been even higher, up to four metres. And it may have been topped with a stone revetment in places or a palisade. Now, we don't know if there was a wall walk along it or a sort of a, 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 a sort of where a, a military personnel would p p sort of walk up and down. But it's a strong possibility that the bank wasn't this 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 um, sort of low, shallow um, slump of a thousand, eleven hundred years of erosion. It would have been a very steep and possibly wall-like structure. So when it's called a wallia by Asser in his biography of, Alf of, of, of Alfred the Great about Offa's Dyke, he is probably thinking of it as a wall, a ditch and a wall. There may have been watchtowers, but we certainly know there was also an eastern ditch in places. And here you can see the eastern ditch um, and sometimes it's separate quarry scoops. So, so there's at least four elements, a counterscarp bank, a ditch, a major bank and a back ditch or a, a, an eastern ditch um, to the monument. So the whole monument is at least 10, sometimes 12 metres across. It's a huge undertaking. Um, it's been estimated it's 798,000 um, cubic metres of soil had to be moved, but I would suspect that's an understatement. I think we may be looking up to a million or more. And it's been estimated that if it was dug in one season, it would deploy at least two and a half thousand, perhaps up to five thousand workers to construct this monument. Um, whether it was uh, done in one season or multiple seasons, you know, if it was more seasons, you could use yes, less people to do it. But that doesn't account for many of the other features we suspect were associated with this monument. This is the line where we're talking about that Offa's Dyke survives in red, but there are also indications it may have gone further. Starts at the Severn, runs up the Wye Valley. We lose it just east of uh, Welsh Bicknor, and then we pick it up across the Herefordshire Plain, and then it's, it jumps either side of the modern English Welsh border right the way up to Troyton in um, Flintshire. But it may have also continued in places further north towards Prestatyn. But it would have also been supplied by beacons that could have been lit to warn uh, of approaching enemies. Uh, watchtowers may have been at various points along the dike or back from the dike. There may have been gates that needed to be defended to let livestock and people through in a regulated and controlled way. There may have been settlements and forts to the east of the monument and perhaps even roads or trackways that were maintained to allow troops to move and other, um, uh, 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 other sort of resources and other people um, up and down the line of the monument. And it's also important to remember to build a monument of this scale. It's not simply the digging of a ditch and a bank or a counterscarp bank and the, and the eastern ditch as well. It, and roads and all these other constructions, you'd have to clear a lot of trees. You may, there may have been stakes in the ditch. There may have been deliberately planted thorn bushes to impede movement. In other words, there may have been all sorts of other features that we cannot see anymore. So what survives is the skeleton. We don't have the flesh on the bones of the broader monument. 
And together, this was not about a line in the landscape like a modern border. This was about controlling a frontier zone. So it wasn't simply about people living either side of this border. It was trying to divide like the Berlin Wall or a, um, the US-Mexican frontier, trying to literally divide at a point in the landscape that was a national boundary. No, I think for, for Mercia, this was about controlling the territory, both to the east and to the west. Now, as I said, uh, many people will think we, well, we know this monument well, but actually it was in 20, 2017 that I was one of the conveners of a new initiative to bring a research network together of students, scholars, uh, heritage professionals and archaeologists, as well as amateurs, to investigate this monument for the first time in a serious collaborative way. And we've set up um, a website, um, the Otfors Dyke Collaboratory, we call ourselves, where we've got blog posts, details of the conveners, and uh, members who are active researchers on the monument and we've held an archive of key events as well as documents and resources so that students and scholars can learn about this monument for the first time. We've held a series of events over the last three years to promote new research and to um, distribute information about the latest excavations, the latest uh, surveys, the latest insights into the monument. And we've also created a series of new projects leading to a research agenda, archaeological fieldwork, community archaeology, and hopefully developing fresh perspectives and synergies and, and collaborations. And we have also set up an open access academic journal uh, to publish the best of existing research and all new research on the Off Offers Dyke. Um, other linear monuments around the world, past and present, to look at frontiers and borderlands, something that obsesses us today and it is a feature of many periods in the past. So we called it the Offers Dyke Journal and I'm co-editing it with my doctoral researcher Liam Delaney and we published the first one in December 2017, Volume 1, and I'm just wrapping up Volume 2 right now and it's available free um, uh, containing the latest information for, as I said, anyone of any age, of any background, can learn about frontier monuments. Let me tell you something about my research, though. I'm doing research on Offers Dyke, and I'm doing that in two ways. I'm looking at the monument and how it operated in the past, and also I'm conducting some fresh research about the perceptions of the monument today, the heritage and public uh, context and political context of Offers Dyke. So this is my map showing you Offers Dyke doing one thing that it does very well. It's not just a grandiose monument arbitrarily slapped on the landscape. It adapts its course very carefully the, to the topography. Here, um, it crosses the Kerryog Valley, blocking movement along the valley and protecting movement north-south to its east. And this is the, a photograph from about here, looking down into the valley, and you can see the surviving line of the monument here, one of its best preserved sections, um, cutting down and carefully adapting its line to, to, to dominate the landscape and to ensure it, it crosses at a point where nobody can sneak past. That's the 13th century castle of Chirk, which is sitting up here um, on the hill opposite. So that uh, may have been a site of an earlier Mercian fort built associated with the dike. And this is a photograph showing you the line of the dike as you approach it from the west, showing how um, this is obviously a much denuded 1100 years of erosion. Imagine how impressive that would have been to anyone trying to, to, to approach it and cross this monument's line in the 8th century, a really formidable line. This is where I was showing you in the video earlier. This is at Nant Mill on the Clywedog, and this is looking up in, in, in the winter vegetation so you get a better view. The huge ditch now followed by a stream and the bank, and there it is crossing the Clywedog, so blocking the rivers. So this is the Clywedog here, and this is what it does repeatedly. Here's the monument at another location further to the north, blocking valleys, therefore controlling movement through the landscape. So the years before this monument was built, people would be able to freely move in this landscape landscape, moving their livestock, moving their traded goods. And when the monument's put in place, not only can't they raid, but they cannot trade through this landscape. So it's a monument that has probably multiple functions and would have completely carved up the landscape in a way that would have shocked and awed people who saw it for the first time.
This is a particularly dramatic uh, place where um, Offa's Dyke winds its way around a, a hilltop with an earlier Iron Age hill fort at Bertha Bank, jumps across a, a, a low valley and then wraps itself around a hill, a, do, a prominent hill. So we can see how it uses the topography to dominate. And one of the things that I've been looking at is how it uses river courses. This is a famous view of from Offa's Dyke overlooking the later um, ruins of Tinton Abbey. Here is a view where Offa's Dyke blocks the Clun River. So it's about controlling movement, not only on land, but on water courses. And indeed, if we flip the map of Britain through 90 degrees, we get a better understanding of how it was in many ways a maritime and riverine monument. Uh, the yellow here is the surviving line of Offa's Dyke. The green is the surviving sections of another sister monument uh, called Watts Dyke that we think may have been contemporary or a little later. And both monuments are about river blocking and river controlling the trade routes and also the maritime routes uh, out into the Irish Sea and the British Bristol Channel. And therefore, Offa's Dyke um, was not only setting a western frontier against the Welsh kingdoms, uh, here's Mercia here, and it was also showing off to the Anglo-Saxon rival kingdoms of Wessex and Northumbria and speaking to a broader Irish Sea world. So in those ways, I hope that gives you a little insight into my ongoing research on Offa's Dyke and uh, I, I'm in as, as my work comes out and gets published, I'm going to be talking a lot more about how the monument worked in the 8th and early 9th centuries and how Watts Dyke um, was, was designed uh, in relation to Offa's Dyke. But I'm also interested in how these monuments matter today. And in, to be honest, in, even in the recent months, Offa's Dyke has been evoked in discussions about the pandemic lockdown. And it's a monument that is a bit of a sleeping giant in terms of the politics of Wales, the politics of it, 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 uh, Brit Britain more broadly, and in English identity as part of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, a bit, a one of its their, the, their greatest works of pre-conquest, pre-Norman conquest English kingdoms that they built this amazing monument in the late 8th century. So thank you very much for listening. And this is just one area of my research. And this is just one aspect of the research of my colleagues. But I hope it gives you a showcase of some of the exciting new things we're up to here at the University of Chester's Department of History and Archaeology. If you've enjoyed this Archeo Death video, why not check out the Archeo Death blog at howardwilliamsblog.wordpress.com.